Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of Choice and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Research Information Management, Library Roles and Opportunities, which is sponsored by Ex Libris, part of Clarivate. Uh, so today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from Choice and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of. Uh, in the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Uh, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our presenters. Um, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A box as they occur to you. Uh, you can also use the upvote feature to highlight any questions that you like. Uh, also note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And with that, we are ready to get started, so I'll pass it over. Great. Thanks so much, Sabrina. Can you all uh, see my screen in presenter mode? Perfect. Well, thanks so much everybody for joining us today. We're so grateful to have you in the audience and sharing your time with us for this webinar. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this ACRL webinar for quite some time, and we have a very large group joining us today, which tells me how important and interesting this topic is for everyone here. Um, with me today is my colleague, Sarah Branch. She's a former faculty member with a PhD in psychology, and she's one of our product experts. She brings her valuable expertise as a researcher with her to the conversation today, and she'll be leading our panelists. Uh, we also have Amy Kautzman. She's the Library Dean and Director at CSU Sacramento, joining us from sunny California, as she said. Um, and Amy brings a great deal of leadership and change management to the conversation and much more. We also have Liz Gushy, who's an Associate Library Dean at the University of Miami. And she has so much insight into the RIM space and leadership that we will all benefit from and much more. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm a former academic librarian, and I'm very, very pleased to join you all today. I'm the research sales manager for North America. We do have just a brief agenda, so housekeeping. We have a lot of questions that we want to ask Amy and Liz. I'm sure you will too. So please put questions in the Q&A as they come into your mind. And then we'll save some time at the end to get some of those questions. If you wanna upvote questions, if someone has the same question as you, please do that. And that'll help us prioritize with the time that we have left. Um, I want to just briefly give you a tiny bit of an overview of what a RIMS is. So if you've never heard that word, if you've never heard that acronym, don't worry, I'm going to help you figure out why, why we're here today. Um, Amy and Liz come from very different organizations. So they're gonna spend just a few minutes describing that to you before we get started. And then we're gonna get into the meat of the day. Uh, that's where we're gonna spend most of our time. And then of course, save some time for Q&A at the end. So what is or are RIMS? Right, And this is the part where I wish we were all together today because this would be a great chance to ask you um, if you've ever heard that, how else you've heard them referred to. But really, a RIMS can go by many different names. Most of you in the audience are probably librarians. You're used to a lot of acronyms, but oh my goodness, when you get into the RIMS space, there are so many acronyms and there are so many people that come to the conversation with their own perspective, with their own ideas. Um, but if you've ever heard of a RIM or a CRIS or a RIS or a expert finding system or a discovery portal, a FAR, all of those acronyms that deal with data, that's what a RIM is. It's easy, right? And RIMs can be used in many different ways by many different stakeholders. I think it's really important um, to mention some of the reports at the bottom. 
because OCLC um, is a, um, let me see, just want to make sure I'm looking at my notes correctly. Yeah, so OCLC research publications is a trusted resource of and source of information for the research community. A few months ago, they put out a landmark, the first of its kind analysis of RIMS and what they are, who they serve, lots of different case studies. It's two documents. I think it's about 100 pages in total. It's really, really important. So if you want to know a little bit more about them or a lot more about them, that's a great resource at the bottom. And speaking about those different stakeholders, they're articulated in that document. One stakeholder group that comes up again and again and again is the research office or the senior research officer and the VPR. So that second paper, the senior research office experience role and organizational structure um, that was um, sponsored by Ex Libris, but it was independently done by Ithaca SNR. That's another really great resource for you to help understand the folks outside of the library that have a key interest in this space. So long story short, the way that I see a RIM is it's something where data goes in, it's connected somehow, and then some story is told about an organization. So there are so many different stakeholders, libraries, Obviously, they're a key stakeholder, the research office, key stakeholder. But because this is growing and there's so much more attention, there are many places for a RIM to touch an institution or many things that an institution can use RIMs for. So the session today will help you understand specifically how two different institutions with different missions tackled this problem of what data they need to tell the story that they want to tell about their institution. So with that, that's my introduction. I'm done. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Amy to talk about um, Sacramento State. <laughs> Great. Good morning, all. So let me begin by talking about the system I work within. The California State University is the largest system of four-year higher education in the country. We have 23 campuses, oh gosh, around 477,000 um, students, give or take many thousands, and around 56,000 faculty and staff. A way to frame our impact in the U.S. is that when you look at all of the Americans that are holding college degrees in the United States, one in 20 Americans graduated from a CSU. So we are a large system and yes, that shows the oversized impact of California, but also what we do for our state and for the US. And this rim is in support, what I'm gonna be talking about is in support of our, our amazing faculty. My campus, Sac State, we are, gosh, around 31,000 students, our focus, is on student success and supporting faculty teaching and research. And the library is growing with our campus and we have a growing SCALCOM program. In fact, we're hiring a SCALCOM librarian. If you know of anybody, I'll post that position, you can apply. But we are an overly ambitious M1 with some R2 aspirations. And um, we're just doing the overview of the campuses right now. So Liz, why don't you do your overview? Oh, sure. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd just like to thank ACRL for hosting, um, for hosting all of us today and for Ex Libris slash Clarivate, uh, Sarah and Jessica, for bringing us together. And Amy, uh, thank you for joining me uh, in this conversation. So this should be fun. So um, University of Miami is an R1 private institution. Uh, we have three campuses. We have a residential campus in Coral Gables. We have a medical campus in downtown Miami, and we have a marine and atmospheric sciences uh, campus also on Virginia Key, which is right on the edge of uh, downtown Miami. We have, I think, about 17,000 students. We have uh, around, gosh, let me check my stats, 16,000 faculty and staff members, and about 3,500 of those are research faculty. And the libraries um, on the campuses, there are seven libraries. And we serve, I think, about 12 schools and colleges. And I think 
can go on to, to talk a little bit more about our rims, or do you want to take it from here, Amy? Sure, I'll jump. We'll, we'll take team. Okay. And, and when we talk about our Sac State Scholars, um, which is our RIM, that's the name of it, I want to begin by stating that when I talk about our campus process, I am channeling a dozen plus people who are engaged in every aspect of the work that brought it live. Our admin, faculty, staff, students all helped to bring this to fruition. I am simply the person on the screen. We know how it is. The deans sometimes seem to get the credit, but everybody else does really all of the heavy lifting and work. So our RIM process began over four years ago when we explored the open source solution Vivo. And it became fairly clear that this was not our solution at the same time that Ex Libris as Esploro entered the marketplace. We're one of the first M1s to sign on to Esploro and we're one of the earliest campuses to go live. And our focus is different from the research intensives and that will come out as we move through this conversation today. But as stated, we began looking into Vivo in late 2017, but upon deeper exploration, we saw that Vivo was probably nearing end of its life cycle. And as an open source tool, as much as we were attracted to that idea, it was a difficult endeavor for us to pick up. Our library systems office came forward with information on Explorer around 2018. It wasn't vaporware, but it was close to vaporware at that time, but it was attached to a company that I trust, one we've worked with for some time uh, within the CSUs. I've worked with um, Ex Libra since the 90s. And while the tool wasn't ready for prime time, I've worked with Ex Libris in developing software in the past. And we understood that if we were to partner with them and become an early adopter, we could influence and get the tool we needed, which was different than what many of the R1s wanted. And um, that we'll, we'll tease that out later, but we had our soft lunch launch late 2021 and we went public, uh, publicly live in January, 2022. So fairly recently. Liz? Yeah, okay. Well, our timeline actually predates me. And so I've been uh, leading this Esploro implementation since um, mid-2018. But our journey started a little bit earlier. In 2016, we adopted the Alma platform. And so that was a real commitment to Ex Libris in terms of their ILS product. And we were contacted in 2017 uh, to be an early development partner, which coincided with conversations with our library dean and our Office of Research and Scholarship. And they brought our research deans and our uh, medical IT and our CIO all together to talk about this opportunity. And um, I'll just go through the timeline really quickly. So we signed on in 2018 as an early development partner, informed the process a great deal, um, worked with our Office of Research to come up with a lot of the functional requirements that we needed to see in the product. Uh, we went live with our repository and did that migration in 2019, and we went live right around the pandemic, so that part's a blur. Then it was kind of a shutdown, as we all know, any of us yeah. living through this part of life. Um, we kind of, after the repository launched, we just kind of needed to focus elsewhere for a while. And then um, really for the past 18 months, we focused in the libraries very much on building the research output of um, the bibliographic research outputs of our faculty and building up that data store and training the algorithm within Esploro. And you know, I think the role of the library in this process is that we've been, you know, at the table from the start in terms of uh, working collaboratively on campus um, to find ways to, to better harness the data that we have and to populate different systems with reliable data. And I would say that, that the role of the library is really kind of three things. It's, it's our ability to do data curation at scale, I think we also are a trusted entity on campus, and we are trusted partly because we purchase trusted resources, and we know how to evaluate resources, and we know how to evaluate data, which has been tremendously important in terms of the Esploro work we've done. And then um, last but not least, and I'd like to give a shout out to Rebecca Bryant and Jan Franzen in their OCLC report, is that they mentioned that transparency is so very important. And so I took that to heart and my team has taken that to heart and that we wanna be transparent about where the data is coming from and what are we doing with that data. So I'll, I'll stop there and maybe Amy wants to talk about the role 
also from her perspective? I really think you've covered uh, so much of what's important. Um, I think the library is seen as a trusted partner. We are not always um, in competition for scarce resources in the way that academic units tend to be with one another. We lift all boats. That's, that's what we do. We are in service to our campuses. And so that really puts us in a prime position to be the people. And let's be real, who manages data and applies it in, in such a nice way like we do? Um, the data cleanup we had to do on our campus that was in our main people's off system just to get it working and interfacing with uh, Esploro was something that really, uh, that's a cataloger job, naming conventions. Who else could do that on campus as readily as we could with the same kind of cr criteria and background? Great. Thank you both Amy and Liz for your introductions. I think it is really valuable to have uh, an understanding of both the institutions and a little bit of the background about how both of you have worked with your RIM systems there as we jump into the questions. Uh, so for the audience, we have created some questions to go through as a panel discussion, but again, please put your own questions in the Q&A and we'll have some time to address those at the end as well. Uh, as we were organizing this, we realized that as we were structuring the questions, it was a bit of kind of looking at the past and the early decision-making regarding the RIM systems at both SAC State and Miami, how things are going now as they've been migrating and going live and really what they're thinking about as they look towards the future. So Amy and Liz, I'm going to go back. You, you both touched on this a bit in your introductions, but I'd like to address it really a bit more specifically. You know, a clear conclusion from that OCLC report, and for the audience, if you haven't read it, I did put a link in the chat to it, is the lack of kind of standardized RIM definitions, particularly in the U.S. It's a little more structure, structured outside the U.S., but within the U.S., um, fairly uh, unstandardized, and the variety of views of what is or is not even a RIM system. So, you know, as you begin this conversation, we have people who are joining us today who I'm sure are just thinking about starting to begin this conversation on their campuses. So at your campuses, as you first started thinking about pursuing a RIM system, how did you define it? What were your key needs or priorities for research information management at your institution? And how were you deciding that? And Liz, being at a, a larger, research focused institution where we kind of tend to see this more traditionally. I'm going to start with you and then Amy, I'm very excited to hear how you approach this coming from Sac State. Okay. Well I thought about I thought about this question and I have to say I'm not sure we've totally cracked the code on on what is a RIMS. I, I think sometimes it's an ever evolving answer and it also depends on who you ask, right? As you pointed out, uh, Jessica early in, in the presentation. But I think Miami took the approach of in a way kind of reverse engineering the question which was to really identify among you know, the stakeholders, what problem are we trying to solve? And what are the challenges that we're trying to solve that may or may not be unique to our institution, right? So some of these challenges I think will be familiar to any number of people. Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to reduce the number of tools that had overlapping tasks. Uh, we wanted a system that would be comprehensive across the entire institution and feature all faculty and all schools of college in one system instead of having a, a you know, kind of a, a variety of things. Uh, we wanted public facing profiles that um, was able to highlight the expertise of our researchers. And we also wanted a system that could facilitate data exchange. And then an attraction of Esploro in particular was the opportunity to help, you know, build that tool to inform that tool, but also the AI features uh, for building this research output. Um, that was something that we really wanted to experiment with. And then there are the other, you know, really common things as well as how can you blend supporting interdisciplinary research with the RIM system? Uh, you want a RIM system that can help you support open access workflows and can also just bring greater discovery to um, research output. And from the library's perspective, we wanted to support digital or well, support scholarship in all forms, all different types of formats. Thank you, Liz. Um, I think we could align ourselves to a lot of, of your goals and what you were working towards. 
Um, but I would also like to point out um, what we aren't interested in on our campus. And, and I don't mean to say that we aren't interested at all, but it's not a leading conversation point, is that of impact factors and, and that of using um, impact factors as a proxy for tenure decisions or how people do in the academic realm. We really wanted to be able to connect our scholars with one another, our scholars with our students, our scholars with our community. Uh, we are an anchor university campus, meaning that we are deeply connected to our local economy. We are in the capital, in the state of California, the fifth largest um, uh, money-making entity in the world. And we continually have people reaching out to our campus looking for experts. And we didn't have an easy way to make that happen. Um, we all know how academics can work sometimes. There'd be a query that would come in from our government relations office about um, this legislator is looking for information on such a thing, who's an expert. They'd write to the dean or the provost. We would write to the chairs. We would say, who does this? Three weeks later, we might get an answer back. Oh, here's the 12 faculty that are experts in this field. And that's not fast enough for entrepreneurship, for commerce, or for lawmaking and, and the management of our our government and we really wanted to find a way to just celebrate what our faculty specialize in and connect them to other people where this is useful be it media or helping to deal with the big issues of our days homelessness or battery management uh, you know it, it's it's one of the things we do we are an applied science institution we do do theoretical research also but so much of what we do is applied research. We make differences in people's lives. And so this is a tool that would help us know one another better, put it in an attractive package, and make it searchable to anybody. There's no mediation that has to happen. That's really interesting. I like the emphasis on, on using it for that connection. Mm -hmm. And you talked about faculty, students, and community. Um, and I think that's a very interesting use case that we often hear mentioned when talking about RIM systems, but maybe not prioritized as much as you're talking about it. Um, so I love that response. Going back to Liz, in what ways was the library really able to either initiate or, or participate in or contribute to that kind of RIM initiative on your campus? You, you touched on this actually in your intro when you were talking about data curation and being a trusted partner. But you know, what is what is it the ex, what is the expertise that the library offers that makes the library a valuable contributor to this conversation about a RIM on campus? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I'll answer this in two ways. I mean, uh, one of the things is is the participation in the conversations since from the from the very beginning. and there there was a natural alliance between our Office of Research and Scholarship and our Dean of Libraries. Um, with some previous work that they had done together. And so this kind of came up organically to some extent. Um, and then it's been perpetuated because these conversations, you know, need to be, fed over time and um, and we've put together a team, a RIMS team as well that includes different kinds of stakeholders on campus and the library is certainly a stakeholder. So part of it is a very specific kind of structure which helps um, you know harness this work on campus you know from the very top. Um, but I would say that some of the library expertise, um, which is definitely, I think I'd like to say made us invaluable to this project is the fact that we've got, all kinds of, of librarian expertise, uh, such as um, evaluating and acquiring trusted sources, as I mentioned before. Um, I think scholarly communications and understanding the scholarly communications workflows and, and life cycle from across disciplines, our liaison librarians really have a good grasp on this. Um, data analytics and data curation absolutely um, that expertise lies in the library. And I would also say we've learned to some surprise that we have perhaps some of the, the strongest um, abilities in terms of data integration and working with APIs on campus. So we have offices that want our data and we realize we really, and I don't mean this in any kind of pejorative sense, we kind of have to, to spoon feed some of this data to them because they don't have the expertise in their areas that, that, um, that we do. And so I think those are, you know, some of the expertise that the library brings. And I don't actually know how you do this project 
um, without, without the libraries. Amy, do you agree? Absolutely. Libraries are essential. I would never disagree with Liz. <laughs> <laughs> what did the process look like for you at Sac State? Because my understanding is you were kind of much more in a, a leadership role in, in uh, moving forward with the RIMS initiative there. So what did this look like at Sac State for you? Yeah, so, you know, I, I have amazingly creative people who work in the library with me. And we began talking about the need for this kind of tool uh, sometime back, and I think it's because I come, come from R1s and, and I'm always looking at everything and saying, oh my gosh, how can I apply that towards libraries? You know, I, I, I have a million critiques about cryptocurrency, but I'm thinking, hmm, how is that going to affect libraries? Could I, you know, sell my uh, special collections images as NFTs? What are the ways that we could, there is nothing that the library can't be the center of as far as I'm concerned. So one of the things that I began doing when we were talking about this is really mapping out the potential of the tool, noting every single unit on campus that it could possibly interface with. And this overview helped me make a list of who could be our supporters and who I needed to sell on this tool because yeah, the library could go out and we could build a rim and we could make it all beautiful, but if we don't get people invested in wanting it to be successful, then it's not going to be successful. And it took us about a year to build a coalition of champions throughout the campus and to check all of the political boxes, because it is political. Every time you bring a new tool on campus, it, there's politics, you know, so met with faculty senate, deans, the uh, Office of Research, Communications, IT, Chairs and Directors, Office of Faculty Affairs, the Provost, the President, everybody had to buy in. And I will tell you that my Provost at the time didn't get it and was not a champion. Uh, that person left, but then the next person was like, yeah, I see this, this is something we need. I just came out of a meeting where we're like, how come we can't get this information? This would be perfect for that. Um, then we also had a number of advisory groups. One was internal to the library, how do we do the work? And one was faculty and um, administrators who interact with faculty all the time and communicated the heck out of what we were doing and why the library is the perfect leader for this. And to be clear, it's not just one round of salesmanship. You don't get just, you don't talk to somebody once and, and yay, it's sold and, and everybody will remember two years down the line when you make this go live. Um, we had to sell the product multiple times and keeping people looped in. And, you know, I knew I was on solid ground when somebody came back from a meeting, one of um, the vice provost, associate provost and um, said, we're trying to solve this problem. And all I could think was, if only this product was up already, if only Esploro, they remembered the name, if only Esploro was up and running, I was like, okay, that's a good sign, you know? And so how can we get this up and how, how can we support the campus work? I think that's such an important point. And I saw Liz kind of smile when you said it too, that this isn't a sell at once situation. It, yeah. and, and to your point that it takes a long time to get system purchased and migrated and implemented and then live. Yeah. Um, Liz, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I saw you nodding vigorously to a lot of Amy's comments. Oh my gosh. I mean, everybody write down what Amy just said and do it because I mean, uh, it, that translates to any kind of organization and really with any kind of project. But yeah, this is long-term. This is long-term work and you have to position this is that success comes with patience and with persistence and with constant communication. That's all I'll add. I mean, it just reinforces what Amy said. Did you ever hear anything about, you know, why the library even cares about this stuff? No, um, I don't think so. I, I, That's I'm, good. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, you know, we're in an interesting place as a system, you know, and, and my, my campus is 75 years old. We're not one of those ancient systems where uh, the, the hierarchies are so solid. This is, this is a very permeable membrane system. I have more freedom to make things happen here. We're an idea campus. I don't know why that is. I've worked in so many conservative campuses where the library could not lead this. I can promise you, and I will not name names, but those who know me know where, where I was. And um, this is a campus where ideas are allowed to float up 
but you have to you have to bring the money you know you have to do the work you have to to make sure that it's going to be successful but it's an open campus and that's one of the reasons that i really um, love working here mm -hmm. and you know our next question was about you know, engaging those stakeholders and, and what relationships you found most valuable. Amy, you've already hit on a few of them. You talked about the faculty, senate, administrators, the provost. Is there any, were there any particular partners that really stood out to you in helping the library move this initiative forward? Oh boy. Honestly, it was All probably them. more of the non-academic units on, on mm -hmm. our half. Um, the faculty are like, if you're gonna help us and we'll talk about that later, yay. Yeah. Um, but it was communications, research, officer research. Um, Yvonne Harris has been a, a big champion of this, you know, and, and I, I don't know who you have on your side, Liz, who's, who's really been pulling for you all. Yeah, well, our Dean of Libraries has certainly been pulling for us all. And uh, again, our Office of Research and Scholarship has also been a really close um, partner. I'm going to pivot slightly to this question, which is, is not to leave out the, the more external aspects of what can help you in this project too. And uh, Miami early on formed a pretty solid relationship with our colleagues at the University of Iowa, who are also early development partners um, with Esploro, as well as Brandeis University. And it really helped to check in with them, you know, two or three times a year, just to get all the experts together and just say, okay, where are you having success? Where are your challenges? And, and how are you leading on your campus? Because you can learn you know, so much from your colleagues who are also going through these experiences. So I would just say, don't allow yourself to have too much tunnel vision in this kind of project. That's great advice. I'm going to pivot us. So that, all those questions were really about how you got started and those early decisions you had to make. Let's talk now a bit more concretely about what the experience has been like as you've actually implemented and, and gone live with your RIM system. So you selected a tool, then you had to actually put it into practice. So one of the first questions is what types of critical decisions have you had to make as you worked to go live with your RIM? You worked hard to sell these various mm -hmm. partners and stakeholders on campus, but then when you got down to the practicality of it, what were those critical decision points for you? Uh, and let's go ahead and start here with Amy. Yeah, so I have, I have two examples that, that I can bring up. Um, I mean, you make a million different decisions, but, but two of them that stuck out in my mind was one criteria of who's included in the system. Okay, this is political. You don't want to have so many people that your system is watered down, but people do research in so many ways on campuses, faculty or, or non-faculty. And we initially started off thinking that the focus would be on tenure, tenure track faculty. And then we expanded into lectures with the three-year appointment because every university has a goodly number of lectures. And of course we click, quickly received so many requests from some of our lecturers who did not have three-year appointments, who maybe teach at multiple universities in, in the greater area. Um, they don't have the same kind of job security, but they're active in research and scholarship. They're probably on the market. And knowing how competitive the academic marketplace is and how difficult it is for them to showcase their work. Um, and, and I have to admit, um, I, I, I received some prodding. You know, it, it's, I, I was like, well, we have to limit, we have to control, you know, it's, it's more work. But we did open up our, um, our tools so that lectures who have a research profile can be included. It's gonna require more work on our end. You know, it, it, we have to track to see when they're working for our system and when they're not working for our system. So should they after a year or so not be here, we have to go in and, and pull them out. But it's one active service in support of lecturers who, let's be very real, labor in an equitable system. You know, how do we give them something? And it's such a little thing. And then we also feature administrators who have engaged in research. Another um, decision we made was about how we really try to highlight people who often work with difficult to capture creative work areas, um, theater, music, dance, choreography, et cetera. Our faculty, as I said, perform both theoretical and applied research, but we wanted to be able to support the creative activities. Scholarly activities are easy. Journal articles, presentations, et cetera, that's easy. 
but working with ex libris we were able to develop a way to expand on the presentations of faculty outputs and one example is a presentation of uh, dr brian g landris's compositions he's a, he's a jazz um, composer and we were able to stream his music via Esploro under his output. And we can still, he can retain control of his files. He will not lose his ability uh, to keep them safe via copywriter being played elsewhere as they're not allowed to be downloaded. And we had to work that feature out because with Esploro originally, they could be downloaded and that is not honoring his work. And this opens up so many possibilities regarding dance, theater, and, and other types of scholarship that we don't think of as the easy to manage work. And just for the audience, we did put a link to that faculty member profile in the chat. So if you want to take a look at um, that profile to, for Dr. Uh, Landris, it's, it's in yeah, the chat there. Musical performance, then go to generations and then click on the view button and you'll be able to, to hear his music. He's quite good. Excellent. So deciding who to include and then be, as you said, being kind of prodded to expand that um, for to support various faculty on campus, the scholarship you're including. Liz, how about for you? What kind of critical decisions have you had to make as you went through implementation? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, Amy set me up for a really, uh, really nice segue. Um, and this may, well, I'll say it now. I could say it later. But uh, we also at Miami, uh, we care a, a great deal that there is equity in terms of uh, visibility of research outputs from across the disciplines. And so we are, it sounds like Amy's a little further ahead than us, but we have established, for instance, a, a very close partnership with our Frost School of Music. Uh, we really took a giant leap forward in the past year getting student output from the Frost School of Music into our repository, which had been a struggle for them. And we worked with the legal team as well as the school to get a workflow that would work for everybody and still protect rights um, for that content while still being able to view it. So that was enormously important to us. And we also are thinking uh, critically um, and hopefully strategically about how are we preparing in terms of thinking about position planning uh, to support uh, equity in, in the capture of research outputs across disciplines. And, and uh, we also, I hope to be hiring a scholarly communications librarian who will be focused on performing arts and humanities uh, in the upcoming year. So I'm hoping to be able to get that position um, actualized. But, uh, and I'll just touch upon another critical decision that we made is that we recently decided that the library would focus almost entirely on building up the research outputs bibliographic data store and that we would also focus on integrations and, and uh, working with people to get the APIs to work for them. So there's a handshake across different systems. And what we have turned over more to the UMIT support side is support for the researcher profiles um, in terms of customizations, uh, ticketing systems, because the library just doesn't have a team to do that at scale. And we thought we could do both and really, I don't, we decided ultimately that we that we can't, at least for now. Great. I mean, that's it's interesting to hear that thought process evolve for you from what tasks and what roles you thought the library could handle versus kind of shifting that and outsourcing some of that for the faculty profiles to another, you know, uh, office on campus there. So you talked a lot early on about getting these partners involved in the initial decisions about a RIM system and pursuing it, selling it multiple times over. So now you've both gone live. How has it actually been received by these various stakeholders at your campus? It sounds like faculty have had some um, feedback already regarding the profiles, but more detail there or any other stakeholders, how they've responded. Oh, is that for me? Uh, yeah, let's go with you, Liz. Okay, okay, I thought, I thought so. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Um, I would say that um, we are beginning to be known as the data people. Um, we've always been data people, but now we're actually being known from other offices on campus that we are the data people. So we're getting requests, I'm very happy to say, for our research outputs, even before we've been able to do very many integrations, you know, our Office of Assessment, our grants team, um, survey folks, they want our data. And so that's great. Um, I would say, so in that way, it's been enthusiastically received. 
Um, as I mentioned before, um, you know, our, our graduate school and our Frost School of Music are extremely pleased uh, that the research output of their students um, has a very high profile place as well. Um, I would say uh, being present at any number of uh, faculty senate meetings recently, I will say that, that many faculty, I don't want to speak of them as, as a blob, um, have system fatigue. They are very tired of moving from one system to another, to another, to another. Mm -hmm. um, they have concerns about their time being spent on data entry. Uh, we're hoping, of course, that um, a lot of what we're building in Explora will help alleviate the need for that, but it won't take care of it entirely. And then the other thing is that um, historically, as Amy touched upon, there are disciplines that have been disadvantaged in the past and may come feeling that it's likely to happen again. And so I think there needs to be an awareness that, that these, these issues and concerns need to be addressed and they need to be addressed, I imagine, um, from any different number of stakeholders, including the libraries and the Office of Research. Great. Amy, how about for your campus? It's a little bit of a different use case there. How has it been received? I, I think we're pretty much on par with uh, what Liz mentioned. We did get one request. So when we put everything out live and, and, and let all the faculty know this is up and running, within five minutes, we got one faculty member demanding we pull down all information. And, you know, I was like, hmm, interesting. But looking a little bit into this faculty member, we knew that they had nothing anywhere online, period. They were a an, an fairly young uh, person, but did not have an online, per, you know, th there's nothing, they, they, which is unusual when you have a very distinct name and, you know, no information online. And I respect that. That is simply a choice that somebody's met and, met and so made. So why would we put more information out there than the person themselves would choose to have? However, every single faculty member does have their directory information and, and other public information posted. So every single faculty member over uh, like close to 1200 of them do have their own site within uh, Sac State Scholars. We just will not go in and, and add all the other information because we respect their opinions. But many people are excited. Uh, we've put out calls for CVs, et cetera, and um, we've been busily filling in the content. And yeah, we, we've been getting some good interest. We, we aren't, I think we're probably about 30, I, I don't know the exact number, mid 30s, uh, complete profiles, and we're continuing to build them. But everybody has an, a, a, a good interface at this point. That's great. That's a lot of work. And I love, Liz, to hear that the reputation of the library as the data people has kind of been formalized, right? That everybody yeah. now recognizes the skills and expertise that, that everyone uh, in the library has and offers to the community. So let's look to the future. You know, as you're thinking ahead, obviously this is a long-term project. How are you thinking about things like staffing? You both mentioned hiring. How are you thinking about staffing in your organization to help sustain these initiatives, which really are campus-wide um, collaborations, but for which the library is doing a lot of work? And yeah, let's so I'll jump into that one. You know, we've owned the entire process, and so it's our responsibility to, to keep the work going. And this is the interesting thing. I mean, we've already talked about how libraries are the very best at organizing information and, and presenting it. And I think that it's common for libraries to work in these liminal spaces on campus, you know, where it's not 100% library, it doesn't really belong anyplace else. And the upside is that we get to center the library in the middle of the conversation. Um, we get to be involved with amplifying the faculty research and all their creative works. And that puts us in the role of a champion, which helps to build our relationship. And we all know that libraries are changing, how people use us is changing. And so finding toeholds in which we can continue to really be part of a faculty member's um, academic career is important. So the upside is we're centered. The downside, well, I'm still paying the bill for this database. I'm trying to find a way to, to share that elsewhere. <laughs> but like many projects, the bulk of this labor is front-loaded. 
Okay, it takes a ton of time to plan the work that needs to happen, to do all the, the baseline work to get the data exchange going, to troubleshoot, to figure out what's going on, to interact with the company when you're building a new system. So, so that's you know one of the joys we always go through. And that for a short-term priority was easy enough to manage. But we promised our faculty that we would enter their data, that we would do the initial data entry, which is a one-time heavy lift, you know, but this is one example where COVID was on our side because we were starting to enter data when the campus is shut down. And I had a core of student employees who I did not want to lay off. They weren't allowed to come into the building what sort of work could I find for them? I was able to give them data entry work. And so we were able to keep people employed. They could keep food on the table, you know, uh, whatever their paycheck went to. And, and I heard from one student that we were the only active paycheck in their family for a short period of time. And granted, the student payroll is never going to pay everything that you need. But I was thrilled that this, as well as a 508 compliance project that we were doing, for the content in our IR, which allowed us to make all of our, our holdings ADA accessible. These were amazing opportunities we had with the students working from home. You know, right now my job is going to be to write explorer work into job descriptions and the work will never be fully automated. It, it, it'll get easier, but it will never be fully automated, especially when it comes to creative works. So while we're past the heavy development stage, we're now in the midst of the supplementing phase and that will probably continue for the rest of our time and we'll have a few staff dedicated to that. But the good news is, is we worked with Ex Libris, we know Ex Libris and this interfaces in a way that we recognize and are familiar with already. It's great to hear. I know Mark Paris has talked in the past about also using undergraduate students. Um, to help build out their room system. Liz, how about for you? What does issues uh, like staffing and other issues to kind of maintain the system now look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, everyone on my Explora implementation team uh, have other jobs, you know, and, uh, but it, it's, it's been a fantastic journey, but I do know that I need to ask for some additional resources to help support this long-term. And so part of the thing I'm, I'm working with my dean is to create a unit for research information management and have those services in the library, which I think will segue very nicely into uh, what we're planning in terms of a physical space for uh, faculty research commons. So providing services that really support faculty in, in, in their research and in their professional growth. And so um, I hope to hire a head of research information management services in the next year. As I mentioned, that skull composition focused in performing arts and humanities. I already have a data scientist on board. I already have a digital publishing specialist on board. So, you know, I'm halfway there. And then I, I see this team continuing to work in a cross matrix way uh, with our Esploro team and with especially strong ties uh, to our um, assessment librarian. And also um, I wanna bring in the role that we've had our liaison librarians play in this as well in that they have deep subject expertise they have built relationships with faculty. They know the faculty's research and they have been absolutely um, critical to um, helping build up this, uh, the AI within Esploro and confirming strong matches um, of output to our researchers, which will then help automate the process as Esploro matures. And so the liaison librarians are a really critical piece in our library. Great. I love, that sounds like an amazing team, Liz. I want to be a part of your team. Okay, come on. <laughs> so we have, we're just, we're just shy of 10 minutes left and I want to make sure we do get times for questions. But as Liz very aptly pointed out, as we were preparing for this, the title of this um, webinar was Library Roles and Opportunities. And so I do want to give you both the chance to answer our last question here before we move to the Q&A, which is what opportunities for the libraries have emerged as a result of the RIMS work that you've done either directly or indirectly here. Um, and Liz, since uh, you led this off, let's go ahead and go to you first. Okay, I'll be really, really fast. Um, I will say that, as I mentioned, the opportunity to be known as the data people, that's been really uh, gratifying. 
Uh, we are now partnered again with the Office of Research to do our ORCID rollout, which will help us uh, do more work with Esploro. It's great to have, I guess, the stick of the Office of Research, and we are the carrot. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, it's been a really fantastic opportunity to have a case study with AI on something that really matters and, and something that's really um, interesting to learn and to grow. And as a result, I'm proud to say, you know, one of our librarians just got an AI fellowship for the summer at UT Austin. And it's largely because the work of, um, that she's done on Esploro. So that's just another great, you know, professional outcome uh, for that individual. And it, she'll come back and help us be even better than we already are. I love that. That's great. Amy, how about for you? Opportunities that have emerged from this? Oh my gosh. I mean, just the, uh, the ability to show off the skill sets in a library and, and remind people, again, that we're in service to them. And of course, Pivot, uh, uh, you know, granting database that comes with Esploro is, is partnered, packaged in with it. Um, that has really tied us into research even more deeply. And so it's just a continuation of the work we do. It's just a new shiny package to, to remind people. Well, I want to thank you for the work that you've both done on your campuses. I know it's not a small lift and it's amazing to see what you've accomplished with it over the last couple of years. And thank you for participating today. We're, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica. She's been watching the Q&A for us while we've been chatting. Um, so Jess, do you have some questions you want to start with? I do. And I think one of them ties very closely into some of the things that you've you've mentioned about the profiles and, you know, some of the time constraints and data fatigue and all of that stuff. But I see a lot of people like Gabe's question, and it's how involved are the faculty or researchers, you know, however they're defined, uh, how involved are they in curating their own profiles? And I guess, you know, whoever feels more strongly first, you can take it away. I'll, I'll jump in. One thing we've noticed is that our more recent hires are very deeply invested in this. They are coming from campuses where there's more often than not an active faculty profiling system. And when they come on board, they're, they're asking where this is. So um, people who are early career, who are more comfortable with technology, um, who are active in doing this work tend to jump in, are people who are extremely accomplished researchers and proud of their work as they should be, are also readily willing to jump into this. Um, and that's all wonderful, you know, but, and, and of course then too, when you want to go up for a grant or make yourself visible in different ways, those folks jump in. What are you seeing, Liz? Well, I would say that, that uh, one of my takeaway points was uh, build in time to work with your faculty before you just release something live, because you're going to want to get faculty engagement earlier in your process. And so we have not yet rolled out our pilots. That is the stage where uh, we're expecting faculty input. So I can't quite speak from a real world experience, but, but again, your liaison librarians can also be so very helpful in this process in, in being an additional voice to, to say, this is coming, you know, uh, we want you to be engaged. Do we have any early volunteers? Is there anything that's going on in your department that we can facilitate with this work? How can we join in you know, to kind of kill two birds with one stone, if you will. Mm -hmm. And can I ask one quick follow-up question? Because Amy, you mentioned that you, your office, your team committed to really building the first set of profiles for your faculty. Did you actually ask them to submit like a CV to you or did your team just go out to what you already had publicly available? Both. So what we did was, of course, we drew in everything from PeopleSoft and we were able to do the crawls and bring in information and verify that information. Uh, we asked for CVs. I, I, I went out and got a goodly number of the deans and other administrators their CVs, because if you don't have the leaders engaged in this um, process, why should all the faculty be involved? Um, sometimes we would have um, from the Office of Faculty Affairs, the most recent hiring CVs, which they were able to share with us with permission. And we just went everywhere. You know, if, if they were in academia.edu, we'd pull some of that information on if we were able to verify. But our students are quite good. They've, they've gotten to be quite good researchers in finding the CVs. And so that's been wonderful. 
still not enough. I mean, we still are needing to go out and we're running a contest right now. Um, so the first department that gets 100% of their people in, we're going to cater a, a lunch meeting for them. Oh. You know, which now that we're starting to meet face to face more often and, you know, we're we're trying to throw out some prizes and make it fun. Mm -hmm. Oh, that faculty love free food. We never outgrow yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> starts it start, starts as a grad student, never stops, right? I know. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. Um, I see um, Mark asked a question about the roles that the Office of Research and the CIO play in your RIM environment during implementation, as well about operations. But I think, you know, maybe do you maybe you could broaden that a little bit because we know how important like data governance teams are. And especially during, you know, the rapid transition for so many to online, the CIO is an extremely powerful office on campus. So maybe you could take that question and expand upon it a little bit with, you know, some of your own interactions with that office as it relates to RIMS, of course. <laughs> Amy, feel free to take that one. I need to think. Okay. Yeah. Um, of course, we reached out immediately to our CIO when we were thinking about this. And I have a wonderful relationship with, with our CIO. He's a good guy. Because this is a place where you could be seen as stepping on somebody's toes, right? Um, who owns this kind of uh, software project? And so there was part of our buildup and we explained what we were doing. We also explained how in a perfect world, eventually we were hoping that some of the information we were curating in this area could be transferred onto the websites and, and replace directory information on departmental web pages. We haven't gotten there yet, but that's a fantasy of mine that we have the same look and feel for all of our faculty data on their pages. But um, when we explained what we were doing, how we were doing it, and we had to work in partnership with them because there was there were some gateways, you know, my, my tech people can talk about it in great detail. I just know that there were areas where um, our IT group had to make data available in a very specific way and that we had to go to them a few times to get clarity or cleaning up of, of processes. And they're an amazing group. Um, and let's be real, all of our IT groups in the past two years have been amazing and keeping everybody supported and keeping us online and doing the instruction. So I think they were probably halfway through thrilled that they weren't involved in yet another big project, but um, it's it's been, you know, in partnership and, and we've been working together with that. Yeah, um, I don't know that I have anything really unique to say. Um, we are also, you know, kind of just a, a third piece of, of a puzzle that it has the Office of Research and Scholarship and uh, University of Miami uh, Technology Infrastructure. And the thing that I'll say that has been challenging uh, during this period, pandemic aside, is the fact that I've been at Miami for three and a half years. And during this time, we've had three CIOs and two different um, vice provost for research and scholarship. And so in a way, it, it, you're kind of starting over in a relationship when a new person comes in. You're, you're retelling the story and you have to be sensitive to um, alignment of, of priorities for those people who are coming into these new roles, right? And, and so sometimes the story shifts slightly and it has to kind of get back on track. And there's, you know, this kind of relationship building that is just ongoing to, to make sure that people's needs and um, and the demands that are placed on them are, are being met. Excellent. And I know we have just a minute left and I see there's some questions still coming in. Um, thank you to everybody who, who has attended and put your questions. We will get to see those afterwards. And I will just point out that Rebecca Bryant, I think, made a comment um, about a second OCLC report. The focus is on the social interoperability of the library, so much of which is what Amy and Liz have been talking about. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and I will take a moment to say thank you on behalf of all of us to everybody who has joined us today. Um, it was amazing to see the amount of people who, who signed up for this webinar. We hope it provided value. Um, and I'll just, if anybody else wants to say anything to wrap things up, then I know uh, Sabrina will jump in too. I would just want to reiterate something that Liz said, that this has been a group effort and all the people working on Esploro 
contact one another continually to get information, to get questions. We spoke to people before we dedicated ourselves to this process. So I can speak for myself, but I'll throw Liz in too, that if you have questions about how to go forward with this or, or, or some detailed questions, you know, we can help you with that because it's part of the library community. We're all in this together. Absolutely. I'd just like to say thank you because I know we're at three o'clock. So thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you so much to Amy and Liz for presenting and Sarah and Jess for moderating this discussion. Um, this is a really fascinating and useful conversation. And thanks to our attendees for your questions and comments. We apologize for not getting to everyone's questions, but um, as Sarah noted, we can we are able to save all the questions so we can ho hopefully follow up with you all later. Um, I'd like to remind your viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Um, also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Your responses help improve our presentations. Um, so thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the session, and we hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. Thank you.